<clears throat> hey y'all welcome welcome back to interstage window my saturday stream uh which is a stream with my friends today i have with here here with me landon say hi landon uh-oh hang on i don't hear you no more girl what there we go okay now i hear you we were fine <laughs> i know uh, hi landon <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if that was like my headphone or if that was actually like zoom or what that was but anyway was, you're back now it was everything you're back now <laughs> Oh my gosh. And we are having an actual podcast episode today, aren't we? It's oh. been so freaking long. What are we talking I about? Missed it so much. We're mm -hmm. talking about uh, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which is yes. our final book review of our Hunger Games series. Oh my God. Oh my God. So we've got this episode that we're going to do and we're going to cover the movie. Um, yes. And then we will actually have wrapped up all of the Hunger Games content that we are analyzing. That's going to be so exciting. It's, I'm very excited about it. Uh, and I have, I, do, I almost don't want it to be over. We were in the Harry Potter trenches for so long. Oh my God, over a year and a like half. such a slog to yeah. get through that this like Hunger Games has been so nice and refreshing mm -hmm. and reminded me why I loved YA. Yeah. And then we're coming here with a new adult book. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, yes, this is fantastic. This is great. And now whatever's next, I'm hoping to be just as refreshed by it. <laughs> I, it's fine. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> So yeah, all right, let me show you guys the, the beautiful PowerPoint that we have for today. Here we go. The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Oh, you can't see the subtitle, but I'll tell you what it is. It says, the best prequel we could have hoped for. Our faces are over the first couple of words, but yeah, the best prequel we could have hoped for. Okay, so before we get into it, I just want to tell you, if you watch like Book Talk, BookTube, any of that, the internet has probably told you that this book is like terrible, awful, no good, don't waste your time. We are here to tell you a completely different story. I hope you're excited. It's so good. So good. I don't, yeah, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. Yeah. Uh, but this this was probably the best prequel we could have ever hoped for uh, from that YA boom uh of our teens, early 20s mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. era to come back and hit us hard in the face and, and make us love it. This is yes. Oh, my God. So, so think of this as like the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is good, actually. And here's why genre um, podcast version from us. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's get into it. We'll start off how we start off every single one of these streams and let's talk about our favorite things. So Karen of the multitude of favorite things here, what was your favorite? Okay. So the thing that I chose to talk about during a favorite things segment this time is Sejanus Plinth. Okay. This character is basically, so you guys know this is a prequel told from the perspective of Snow, President Snow, when he's a teenager, before he is president. You know, he's basically a kid at this point. He's like late high school, early college age-ish, kind of, um, basically, uh, the way that this world is set up. That's where he is in his life. He's like towards the end of his education. So... Um, so Janus is his bestie, all right, his friend. And um, so Janus is so cool because he is a kid who was originally from the districts, okay? And then his family um, is, is in this position where they kind of like rise up. They are able to transcend to kind of the next economic class that exists in this world. And they end up moving their family from District 2 into the capital, okay? So Sejanus has a very complicated relationship with um, with class and how he feels about that because he feels like in an identity way, he cannot be capital. He is district. He can't deny that he is originally from the districts. And lots of people treat him that way. Also, like this is not something that is lost on his classmates. They see him as district as well. And he very much struggles with that. Like, how do I live in the capital while still being district and knowing how much hate there is towards the districts? And um, and he very much feels like the capital's hatred towards the districts is not as warranted as they believe. 
uh, he so he kind of like really is that voice to remind the reader that like what the capital did was awful actually even though the capital is suffering quite a lot in this book and we'll get into it when we get into the summary that um the rebellion the original rebellion that happened from the districts was morally justified so janus is there to remind us of that and he does such a good job i just love him so much i think it also it also shows us uh it, it reminds us of a different system that exists during this time mm -hmm. than when we see it later on, especially a class system or a financial situation system where with uh, with Katniss, there would never be any idea of a family being able to rise from the districts to go to the capital. You were mm -hmm. either capital born or you were nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is showing us the early steps of those systems where it's still possible that there's still intermingling between cap between uh, different districts in the capital, that you are able to have that forward momentum um, before the system gets too corrupt. And that almost reminds me of a certain system that exists in our society that is what? no longer <laughs> working the way that it originally was intended to. I don't know what that could be. Uh and so I think that that also hits home there, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, it's also partly because of the districts that they are from that I believe that happens. So there's no indication that someone from District 12 could become rich enough to move to the capital. Um, yes. And so Janus is originally from District 2. So kind of what is implied with this character is that if you are from one of those sort of like career tribute districts where some wealthy people do live, such as 1, 2, and 4, then you could um, eventually move to the capital. But even if you do move, there's going to be problems, which is what happens with Sejanus's family. Like his parents are very split on this decision. His mother clearly did not want to leave District 2. She liked their life there. She felt safe and, and around her friends and, and good there. But their father was quite ambitious. And, uh, and he just thought that, oh, if I move my family to the capital and my son gets a capital education, he's going to be so much, you know, better suited for life in this clearly unfair world. And I, I kind of sympathize with both of his parents in this situation. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm like, when his, when his mom kind of expresses that, it's like, well, you're right. You're right, honey. Maybe they should have never moved. But then his, you know, his dad is like, clearly has that other feeling. It's like, oh, well, you're kind of right too. You are like making sure Sejanus is set up for more success in life. Like, I can see it. I get it. Well, and also on the, on the same, on the same coin, we see, what could have happened to Sejanus should he have stayed in the district? And that's that he was vulnerable to be chosen for tribute. Mm -hmm. One of his friends, one of the people he knew from District 2 was chosen as a District 2 district. He was not safe there. Yeah. He is safe supposedly safe. in the capital well the dangers uh, the dangers are less deadly. put it that way. He is not safe well, in the capital, but the dangers are a little less deadly. Uh, spoilers <laughs> spoiler alert uh, so this is a spoiler co podcast we know what this that means yeah yeah we'll talk yeah about it here in the summary in a second yeah not uh, spoiler free not spoiler free so that's my favorite thing so janus i think he was a great character he was my favorite out of all of the side characters um we're going to talk about the non-side characters later but before we do that uh landon what was your favorite thing from this book my favorite thing was dr gall now here's the deal Every story needs a villain and every story of corruption needs a person with a philosophy so outside the box that stretches humanity to the brink of monsterhood. And this is that woman. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Gall is the, uh, not creator of the Hunger Games, but certainly the uh, mastermind behind what they become mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. what they are used for. Uh, and we see her as a mentor-ish to Cornelius for most of the book. Uh, while, while she certainly isn't a mentor until probably near the end and was revealed to be more of a influence on him than, than was originally thought, she... Uh, She's the game maker, the original mm -hmm. game maker in the background, pulling all the strings and letting uh, humanity show its monstrosity by allowing the Hunger Games to exist. And I think it's always interesting when we have a book where we are not supposed to root 
for the protagonist, how they, how the writer makes us do that. Mm-hmm. And by throwing in a Dr. Gall uh, and allowing us to see the corruption step by step of Cornelius is how Susan Collins decided to do this. And I really mm-hmm. appreciated that. Mm-hmm. I, I would agree. Dr. Gall is such a cool character in the book. Um, I From the initial kind of trailers and how they've got her styled, like I'm just looking at this picture here. She's got like this, this purple and gold on. She's got like this big hair with the white streak through it. You know, um, it's very Ursula looking. Is, is she not? Yeah. Is she not? And uh, And so I'm very excited to see how they portray her in the in the movies because she is probably in the book the uh, character w- that we are given absolutely no opportunity to empathize with she is completely irredeemable um she takes the idea of the hunger games and makes them worse and that is all her character does the entire book basically um yes. just constantly thinking about how the hunger games could be even worse uh and she i think it's also interesting because uh she is so like not only are we not able to empathize with her but we're also meant to dislike her like yeah. she's very kooky mm-hmm. she almost speaks in like rhyme and it's 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 supposed to be jarring and disliking especially in a world that feels so full and almost like it could be real to then have this creature of sorts uh just who is there to make things worse yeah, uh, and being like, how does that exist? And then you recognize that, like, that actually does exist. Yeah. There are people that like that. <laughs> there, there are people like that. I mean, it's uh, you know a, a certain politician that has absolutely no um, public speaking skills, and yet somehow people always want to listen to him. Comes to mind. Very, very strange, you know. Oh gosh, who could that be? I wonder if this was inspired (laughs) off of a certain time or our political, uh, political tale in our country. uh, I mean, coming out. Who knew? (laughs) I mean, I mean. mean. (laughs) So those were our favorite things. Just to remind you guys, um, this is not a spoiler-free podcast. If you have not read *Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes*, then and you want to, and you want to do it without spoilers, you should leave now because it's only going to get worse from here. We have barely scratched the surface. Um, so yeah, this is your this is your warning if it wasn't obvious from the favorite things segment. Um, so we'll move on to our summary. Yes. Now, I will be honest, Landon dropped the ball a little bit on this one and I did not write a summary, so I have found no! a summary. I know, I know. I have found a summary, but I have put in places where I'll put in commentary. So okay. these words are not exactly my own, but it's short and sweet and to the point. Okay. Um, so this book, A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, is about young Cornelius Snow as he is 18 years old and in his final year at the Academy, which is the uh, highest form of education in the capital before university. And as a uh, project, he has been chosen as a mentor with 23 other fellow students to uh, mentor one of the tributes in the Hunger Games. This is the 10th annual Hunger Games. Uh, we learn a little bit about Cornelius Snow before he is chosen, though, that he and his family have been struggling financially, although keeping on the, uh, keeping on the ideas that he is still rich and as powerful as his family once was, uh, but ha- having lost all their mud- money in financing District 13 during the war, uh, then they lost everything and mm-hmm. he and his cousin tigress have been coming up with creative ways to keep their own title and wealth among or uh, the seeming of of wealth amongst everybody um so once he when he is awarded or assigned the girl tribute from district 12 he takes this as a snub to him and his family um and And although he uh, yearns to succeed, he does not think he is going to. However, Snow, his his tribute, Lucy Gray Brard, uh, has a few unconventional advantages. Uh, She's a talented musician. And as her name is called, she puts on a show for all of her district, uh, singing a song during the reaping ceremony uh, that results 
in uh, people kind of adoring her and Snow watching the reaction of the people of the Capitol uh, enjoying her song and thinking we might have something here. Uh, they sh Snow ends up meeting her right off the bat and uh, there the people really like that and seem to start getting an interest into the lives of these tributes rather than the uh sort of glazed over look that they had had before um the uh, sorry i lost my place um we also learned that sir janice is one of the mentors along with snow uh and his mentor his mentee is actually someone from district two that he knows personally and grew up with uh dangers continue to escalate when during a visit to visit their uh mentees a bomb uh goes off and kills a couple of the mentors as well as several of the tributes snow and lucy survive uh, but some of the district's uh, mentor mentees attempt to flee while Lucy attempts to save Snow's life. Um, Sir Genesis' tribute escapes for the time being. Uh, and then the Hunger Games starts. Uh, Snow and Lucy make a plan going to navigate the, the games. Um, it mainly consists of hiding until other contestants have died. Snow urges Lucy to use a poison to weaken her op opponents um, and offers his dead mother's compact that has some rat poison inside of it. When the game starts, Marcus, uh, who is the District 2 uh, tribute, is revealed on camera, badly beaten and hanging from ropes, but still alive as a way to show uh, the, the capital's displeasure at his attempt to escape. But uh, that night, it is revealed that, uh, that Sir Genis sneaks in trying to rescue Marcus and Snow quickly follows after him. Uh, and tries to help Sir Genis uh, in recovering Marcus's body. Uh, Lucy faces off uh, after they are able to escape. Lucy faces off against several uh, of the tributes in the games where she is able to use some of her evasive strategies to her advantage, as well as some of the poison that she has. Uh, there is a whole situation with some deadly snakes that Snow... Uh, realizes his, the mentor is going to his mentor Dr. Gall is going to put into the arena and so he uses uh, a handkerchief with Lucy's scent to throw off the snakes so they will not attack her and they end up creating this lovely skirt around her and attacking everybody else but her and that seems to please the people watching it and making it much more exciting uh and in the end, Lucy wins the Hunger Games. Uh, however, the Dean of the Academy corners Snow and reveals his mother's compact along with the handkerchief and accuses Snow of cheating. Uh, Snow agrees to become a peacemaker, losing his spot in the university uh, and goes to District 12 as a peacekeeper as his punishment and while he is there uh he doesn't like being a part of the peacekeeper <laughs> society he is not meant to be one of the army men of the ranks uh turns out being a cop is not in his future um and he has a really tough time until sir Janus ends up ends up joining him as well uh having been found guilty for trying to get marcus's body back um, the two of them become closer and Snow is able to reconnect with Lucy as she is singing on stage at a party. Um, they grow closer and closer over time. There's a little bit of, of intrigue and a little bit of love triangle-ness with uh, Billy Top, who is uh, Lucy's formal, former love interest. Um, 
In fact, Billy and Sergenis become implicit in a plot to free a pre- prisoner from key- peacekeepers uh, to seek refuge outside of the district. And uh, when the mayor's daughter of District 12, Mayfair, threatens to reveal their plan, Snow ends up shooting her. And Billy, who is a friend, also gets shot in it. Uh, so uh, trying to cover up this murder that has been happening, uh, Snow and Sergenis still try to play as if they are just everyday peacekeepers and find some jabber jays, which are birds that we see in the original Hunger Games that can record information and then repeat them later on with uh, incredibly accurate, incredible accuracy. Uh, they speak. Sir Janice records, um, or Snow records Sir Janice using a ja- by using a jabberjay about betraying uh, the peacekeepers and the capital and moving on and running away. Uh, and so he, Snow ends up sending in the tape to Doctor Gall, uh, betraying his friend and trying to convince himself that Doctor Gall would never listen to it anyway. Turns out that's not true as Janus is hung for treachery and Snow feels responsible for the man's death. Uh, Lucy and Snow end up running away from District 12 together. And after several hours of hiking, they come across a shack where the guns that Snow had had used or the rifle that Snow had used to kill uh, Billy is... Um, found or that is found and there's some heated conversations between Snow and Lucy and Snow realizes that he could never be someone who lives out in the outdoors camping is not for him uh, and upon asking Lucy if she would want to change plans she's like I'm good I'm gonna go get some Katniss and hunt for a second you stay here uh and Snow realizes that she no longer trusts him and he ends up trying to hunt her down opening fire on an area that she thinks he she might be uh, as she's using mocking jays to disguise her location Snow returns to the capital thinking perhaps that she has died and when he comes back, Dr. Gall welcomes him back with open arms, basically saying, hey, dude, this was just a test to see if you'd be loyal to the capital after all. And we know that you are. And now you know that your purpose in life is to help make these Hunger Games great again. Mm-hmm. And uh, Snow continues to work the rest of his life with Dr. Gall, including coming up with the Founders Village and prize money for the, the um, not the Founders Village, sorry, the Victors Village, along with coming up with prizes for the victors, getting the capital citizens engaged, including betting and other things as well. Uh, and it is revealed how the Hunger Games started was that the Dean who had sent him to the peacekeepers long ago had once known Cornelius's father and on a drunken night had come up with the Hunger Games as a project for the Academy. And Cornelius's father uh, ended up submitting it as his idea where Dr. Gall took it and ran. And as a moment to, protect his legacy and his father's legacy, uh, Dr. S- or Cornelia Snow ends up poisoning the Dean and starting the legacy of poisoning anyone and anything that threatens to destroy him. And that's so as you can probably tell, this is a really long book. <laughs> it's a really long book. It's I like all of that was important. <laughs> mm-hmm. And there's even stuff that Landon left out that we're going to touch oh, on yeah. later when we talk about certain characters. But yeah, this is a really long book. And um, and I want to kind of talk about this in a little bit of segue into some of the more um, obvious and more valid criticisms of this book. Um, so overall, a lot of people really struggled with it because they came, they came in expecting like the super tight narrative that exists in the Hunger Games. And that just doesn't exist in Ballad. 
it is long, it's meandering, it kind of like does its own thing at a whole bunch of points. Hey baby, hey Alpha Tiff, hey Lunar, by the way. I said hi to Lunar, but only in text. Um, welcome in. You guys, welcome in. You are not too late. We are just getting to the good parts. So, so yeah, a lot of people didn't like this book. And what I think you're gonna find when we talk about this is for the most part, people disliking this book has a lot more to do with like comparing it to the original Hunger Games trilogy than anything this book is doing by itself. So I think if you go in expecting that, like, yeah, you're gonna have a bad time because it is long and meandering and there's a lot of stuff that happens that's like, oh, like this could have been cut. Like, yeah, it could have, but it's a character sketch. It's not yeah, an I, action book. And that's the thing, right? Like, this is a character sketch. This is not an action book. And it's also not a book that needs to be believed at surface level. Yeah. And that's something we'll get into a little bit more here in a bit. Um but man, oh man, this is such a good book. It's really good. So, um, so yeah, a few things to critique. It is, it is, I don't remember what the order the bullets go in here, Landon, so you have to show them. Okay, so the names. So I also saw a lot of nitpicking about the names, okay? Um, you know, we talked about this in our Hunger Games uh, series about how the capital is clearly supposed to be reminiscent of um ancient rome like in the the opulence of the roman empire right and so all the names are like vaguely latin um well man if you didn't get it in the hunger games trilogy like they beat you over the head with it in this one absolutely everyone's name is like latin everyone's um it's all very roman uh and uh, <laughs> like and literally all, all the names it's all reference to like cornelius is the dictator obviously cornelius's name was that before but like like, it, there are reasons why each of these characters are named what they are. Yeah. Too. And it has to do with their, their Latin and Roman roots. It has to do with... Uh, she truly was just like, you didn't get it the first time. And so I now need to spoon feed it to you. <laughs> That's what I feel like, too. And a lot of people criticize it. And I think they're coming off of, like, you know, making fun of the Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling's names. And they felt like this book was kind of doing the J.K. Rowling thing. But I completely disagree. I completely I think that the names are so obvious and crazy in this because so many people literally didn't get it. They didn't get it. <laughs> I also think it's really unfair to an author to be angry at the idea of using uh, thematic names mm -hmm. when using ridiculous names for fantasy is such a trope. Yeah. I'm like, no one is over here questioning, questioning the names of the high fantasy books and the ridiculousness that authors come up with, with being like, those don't even phonetically make sense. Like... <laughs> And and here we are angry that we're using we're using Latin names to reference a Latin time to make that connection. I just mm -hmm. think it is very silly to get angry at the names. It's very silly. Um, and the names are not as bad as Book Talk made it sound. It's and when you're no. in when you're in the process of reading it, the names do not feel silly or out of place or take you out of the story. They simply don't. They simply and don't. <laughs> like there is a purpose to have these Roman names be in the capital and then have names like like marcus is a little bit more roman but that's like district two but then lucy gray like that mm -hmm. there's a reason because she's district 12 she's so far removed so far outside billy is so far outside and so like i know a lot of the critique was that there is like that distinct difference too and that is purposeful Mm -hmm. That is done on purpose. It's like, but there would be because the capital is trying to do everything that they can to differentiate themselves as a, as another class of people. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a different culture. Like, that's the other thing, too, of, of like different cultures have different names involved. Mm -hmm. And the capital is a completely different culture than than the districts. And uh, you see that in the names. The snake, snake gives me Taylor Swift reputation vibes. Oh, my God, Lunar. <laughs> Well, this is a villain story. <laughs> it is a villain story. <laughs> um, the length, yeah. So, so this is what I was kind of touching on to segue into this. 
it is long. People that were like, oh my God, it was so long. It was so boring. It was so meandering. They're not wrong. Okay. They were actually telling the truth. It's just that they misunderstood the type of book that this is. It is not an action book. The Hunger Games trilogies are action books. This is a character sketch. So yes, there are parts of it that are not directly related to the plot that are just there to give you insight into Snow and how he feels about other people. There are tons of passages where Snow goes on and on and on about how he feels about Lucy Gray. And all of those passages are basically about how he wants to possess her and control her. And so you are getting a lot of this. And I think that what happened to a lot of people is they were reading this, they they are weak and dislike villains. I'm sorry if you hate, if you don't like villains, you don't want to read from a villain's perspective. That's what this book is. So maybe don't read it. But you are weak and won't survive the winter. I'm sorry. That's just how it is. And so, and so uh, what that means is you get these paragraphs upon paragraphs of Snow just having really awful, disgusting, negative thoughts, particularly about Lucy Gray. And, um, and that is true. So these people that disliked that, they're, they're wrong to dislike it, but they were telling the truth. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think also we're so not used to uh, a three act structure in Well, we are a three act structure in books, but not so blatantly. Like people are like expecting the hunger games to mm -hmm. be this book and the hunger games ends halfway through. Yeah. Like Half the hunger games is the first part <laughs> is literally him becoming a cop. And then, and then like trying to assimilate into district 12 culture yeah like that is what a huge large part of this book is and if you aren't willing to read it for the character change then then you're not you're, you're like if you're if you're a speed reader you're not gonna enjoy this book you're not because um, the thing is in the hunger games part of it is such a small part of the book and in addition to that you're reading it from snow's perspective so you're reading it from the perspective of 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 somebody that's watching the games, not somebody that's in the games. So there's a lot of things that are happening inside of the games that we do not know about because at this time, the capital simply doesn't have the uh, the technology that they have set up in the later one. So like the spectators, there's a lot of stuff that happens that the spectators just don't know about. Um, so for example, whenever they have the games, they literally hold it in a stadium. And remember during the summary, we talked about the bomb, the bomb that goes off in the stadium. So when that happens, when the Hunger Games actually start, there's all of this rubble and stuff around. So even if you're in the stands watching it, even if you're watching it on your TV or whatever, like there's places that are just covered by rubble. And so you don't know what's happening. Yeah. And, and that's, that is a huge complaint, but like what... I think was very interesting is that, and we'll talk about it when we talked about snow, but like snow made it interesting. He like, mm -hmm. and went to the pub and was like, this, this is why it's good is don't worry. They're mm -hmm. all hiding, but eventually they have to came out, come out. And that ended up adding to, instead of it being like a, a full on fight gladiator style, it added to what the games would eventually become, which is here, we'll give you times to hide. And then we won't on mm -hmm. some others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's talk about a snow. Snake in the grass. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Jesus. I. First of all, we we know Landon loves a man who is tall, blonde with daddy issues, which is Cornelius Snow. <laughs> um. <laughs> let's talk about his background a little bit. Uh, Cornelius Snow lives with his cousin Tigress. Who yes, it's that tigress. First, that tigress. It is that tigress. Uh, we know her from the first, from the third uh, of the Hunger Games books, and uh, his grandmama, who is, uh, you know, a little stuck in the wartime mindset, as one is. Uh, they're left in their family home that is large and looming and falling apart, and unable to afford meals for the mm -hmm. most part mm -hmm. uh they are as poor as you can be in the capital and probably poorer than most anybody else yeah the only reason that they're not completely destitute is because their family used to be rich so they have the house at least but mm -hmm. they can't afford to keep the house up they can't afford no. food they can't they they the only reason cornelius even really gets to go to school is because he has the snow name yeah. um and people knew his dad 
Um, and like, like to give you an idea, if you haven't read this book of how this book is written and how much of a character study this is, the first chapter is literally Cornelius worried about finding a shirt that's appropriate for him to wear to a ceremony. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the different ways that he is panicking about this shirt and like that just shows so much in his character of like how forward presenting he has to be uh how how much pressure he is under to keep up appearances um and how much he is keeping up appearances because nobody knows Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's one of those things they have this constantly through the book this saying snow falls on top And Cornelius has taken on this weight from the family, that he must be the one that brings the family back to where it was during the pre-war times and kind of like restore the glory. Um, Now, Tigris is here at the same time, and, uh, and we don't have a super deep dive on her. So I just want to mention that she is older than Snow. She's a few years older than him. She she does not take this on. She takes on instead this thought of like, she wants to be able to survive enough to be able to express herself. So she is very into like her art, which is basically, she's a seamstress. Um, and she is willing to do all manner of things to make sure that they have enough money to where Cornelius doesn't go hungry Um, up to and including selling her body. It is pretty explicit. We don't, there's not a scene where it happens, but they do everything but say that like she will do anything to make sure that Cornelius doesn't go hungry. Um, And she has quite a panic later on in the books where they change some tax laws to the point that they think they might lose the house. Um, and, uh, and she is kind of like instrumental in that part. So that's all the different things Cornelius is dealing with. He's got this older sister, older cousin, really, that, um, that really wants to take care of him and is doing her best. He's got this grandmother that's, um, too, too old and senile and stuck in the past to really do anything to help. And so he takes on the weight of like the family's reputation. So that's kind of where he is and where he's coming from. I think it's also important to recognize that uh, the culture that they're living in, too, they're living in a capital that's 10 years out from a war that really destituted and traumatized a lot of the citizens of the capital. Uh, obviously, other other uh, places are showing that as well mm-hmm. uh, and are, are now going through the same trauma of a post-war time. But we see a capital in the Hunger Games that is so vastly different from this capital. Uh, this capital is struggling. This capital is apathetic to the Hunger Games, doesn't like the Hunger Games, thinks it's uh, most people turn their head or try to ignore it. They don't want it to exist. And the reason why I think Cornelius is so apathetic but more in an apathetic like it doesn't affect me but I want it to continue happening sort of way is because he is actively living with a with a grandmother who is who thinks the war is happening now Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um who is who is who is aware it's not but is making the decisions and the choices and saying things like they're going to be bombed at any moment yeah. Um, and it's constantly he is he is living like it's during wartime when it's not. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So he's he's stuck in the trauma and the pain that everybody else is slowly removing themselves from. Yeah, because like the way they talk about the capital at this time is there's still areas that are like really run down and really messed up from like the war and the and bombed and like but they basically have rebuilt most of it at this point. There's not like, there are slums, but not that bad. So like everyone's kind of like ready to move on, which is why they have to make changes to the Hunger Games and say like, well, we're going to institute mentors this year, right? Because of course the powers that be do not want another rebellion. And so they know they need to keep the districts down and they know the Hunger Games could be a vehicle for that. So that's yeah. basically how that happens and why Cornelius takes it very seriously because he sees it as his ticket to bring his family back to glory because that's clearly what the ruling class wants is to keep the Hunger Games, even though all of the citizens don't want it. Yes. And um, he's also struggling with like, A, the how to do that, but also like, okay, 
I am supposed to have it be kept together. No one can see through these cracks. And I'm also being snubbed by giving, by being given the worst possible candidate. Mm -hmm. District 12 girl. Not even that, like he even straight up says, and something I actually really appreciate uh, is like the acknowledgement of sexism of being like, it's not even the boy. The boy would at least have a chance. Uh, (laughs) The the, the girl is is weaker. Yeah, because he's (laughs) at least, the boy might be strong. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, but like, so that he has been given, he's been given a chance, but it's the worst possible chance. And it's because of this decision from the Dean that he doesn't understand why the Dean hates him. We later learn, obviously, that it's because the Dean blames him and his father for the invention of the Hunger Games, since it was the Dean's idea that was later stolen. Yeah, Um, yeah. But it, there is like this, chi- he is such a chip on his shoulder, along with his family's legacy that he's holding up on his shoulders. Uh, and the other important part, too, is to explain that his father was a war veteran, mm-hmm. uh, a heroic war veteran uh, that died in combat. Yep, yep. So so he does, he never really knew his father. He only knows his father's reputation. And so he takes all of this weight. And then of course, you know, he's he's accused of cheating and saying like, you know, you helped her smuggle in poison and all these things. And he's sent off to be a cop in District 12, right? And guess what? Being a cop makes him worse. All of his worst instincts are made greater during the time that he is a peacekeeper in District 12. And, and to make it clear, he hates it like there's a point in time where he's considering not he's considering unaliving himself yes because he hates being a cop so bad Mm -hmm. because he doesn't like to be put under anyone's shoes he doesn't like the order of things he doesn't like the the stigma to his reputation Mm -hmm. he doesn't like to be one of the masses no he doesn't want to get his hands dirty at all at all he likes yes he likes the concept of being a snow ending up on top but he doesn't like to be a snowflake amongst the snow pieces Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. he wants to be the the thing entirety Mm -hmm. um and yeah his instincts get a hundred percent worse uh and and the peacekeepers are obviously shown as a corrupt um form of of society and that are not there to help people um <laughs> and are are there for their own self-interest and we watch mm-hmm. Cornelius's self-interest grow uh yep. specifically around a certain young girl yeah that he is convinced he's falling in love with so he believes that he believes that he's falling for her and this is something really interesting. So we know that Snow is the snake, right? Like Snow is the one that gets an affinity for poisons and, and ends up poisoning people. He encourages Lucy to use the poison. But something you might not know is he actually got this idea from Lucy herself. So when we first are introduced to Lucy, and we'll talk about her in a moment, what she does is she picks up a snake and stuffs it down. I think it's it's mayor's daughter, right? Or yes. yeah, the mayor's daughter's dress, um, and uh, and causes this big old scene. Now you find out later there's all this drama between her and the mayor's daughter because Lucy's ex left her for the mayor's daughter, and like it's all kind of drama craziness. Um, but like Snow sees this. And this is what sparks his thoughts on poison. He does not come up with it himself, okay? And we, you continue to see this throughout the book. If you have not read this, I encourage you to read it through the lens of thinking, you know, when does Snow ever have an original thought of his own? He doesn't. I don't believe that he does. I think, like, we summed it up of that Snow owns nothing himself. Mm Mm-hmm. Snow doesn't own anything that isn't someone else's before, and he doesn't have an idea that wasn't somebody else's before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a really interesting take on this character that is so shallow because he's carrying the facade of a legacy. Mm-hmm. That the whole time. Doesn't he doesn't own anything. So we're talking about like, okay, there is this idea of how to make our, the snakes and poisoning people obviously continues to come from uh, Lucy. He has this idea of like how to make betting 
and and other things worse that's from other people it's sir john janus i think says something well they have like they have like this group project that they do right but it's a group project of with a bunch of 18 year olds so obviously everyone drops the ball and snow ends up being the one that actually writes it down but everything he writes down he didn't come up with any of it he just was the only one willing to do the work and write down everyone's thoughts but they all came up with it yes and um you know, even the the idea of running away was Sir Jonas's. Like there, there are so many other ideas that exist that Snow did the work for, but didn't have the creativity or the idea itself. There is no original thought. Um, and then we learn that that in itself is some part of its legacy mm-hmm. because that's what his father did. Mm-hmm. His father Mm -hmm. did not come up with the idea of the Hunger Games. He stole it from the Dean when they were drunk and then submitted it as like a co-project. And so like, it's like that is actually part of upholding the legacy is taking other people's ideas. And what I really, really loved about this take was then we connect it to the movie version of the Hunger Games as we're seeing adult snow with Heavensby having those same thoughts and things like this is even a conversation that Karen and I had mm-hmm. of being like mm-hmm. whose idea was it actually well knowing when we know Heaven's snow bees. now it has to be heaven's be uh-huh. that snow then just put forward as his idea yeah because snow doesn't have is, ideas because he doesn't have ideas yeah uh and and everything is recycled um and yeah, there, there's like at one point, there's like at one point where he goes through and he's like, he's collecting his things because he's going to go to 12, right? And he he gets like, um you know, something from his mother. He has some photos. He has a compass from his father. And then in the end, he actually ends up losing most of that stuff. The only thing that survives is his father's compass. So it is very clear that like when it comes to snow, there is nothing that he is doing of his own. Only his father is inside of him. That's it. Well, and yeah. And then we have like his mother's compact, his mm-hmm. father's shirt, his, uh, you know, he, everything that is of value to him mm-hmm. or is a, of assumed value to him belong to someone else before. The roses. The story of. The roses oh, yes, are his grandmother's. Yeah. You think ro- white roses is a snow thing? You're wrong. It was his grandmother. He took that too. He took that too. Um, the smell of roses, loving to grow roses. His his grandmother liked the red roses. He liked the white roses because of the purity, blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, snow thing. But like that is something that he took. There is There is nothing original about Cornelius. Not a thing. Um, and that's what makes him so compelling mm-hmm. because I think that we're so used to kingmakers and chosen ones as uh, either like as the important protagonists in stories, especially in YA new adult stories, mm-hmm. uh, that we never truly see a king character. And that's what this is. This isn't a chosen one. Cornelius is not the chosen one. He has been primed and primed and raised to be a dictator king, which mm-hmm. is the idea of he will take the ideas of others, filter it through himself and give it out to the world, mm-hmm. which is what we see later in the later in obviously in the Hunger Games. But we see that sort of character now and how that and how he grows into that. And it's so cool. Yeah, it's so well crafted and it's so well done. Um, I really, I really just think like, you know, if you hated this book, like give it another chance. Like after you've heard this snow section, if you don't like it, give it another chance. It's so good. But I also think it's so a niche, but also so like in the details Mm -hmm. that if you're expecting the kind of character that has come from YA authors uh, to end up with this it would be very alarming and see very like drab. Yeah. And it is, it's a sad story. Lots of sad, gruesome, horrible things happen. It's true. So in addition to snow, we also want to talk um, specifically about the other main character of the book, Lucy Gray Baird. So she is the songbird of the songbirds and snakes. And let me tell you, okay, I didn't know what to expect going into this. I truly didn't. But in this book, There is not a Katniss in sight. Lucy 
is the anti Katniss. She is the opposite of Katniss. She is the, the, just the completely other type of girl. There is no Katniss inside of Lucy Gray Baird whatsoever. This girl is a actress. She is through and through a performer. That is who she is. Yeah. She is not surviving based off of her strength and skill. She is surviving based purely off of her social skills. That's how she's surviving. She's like, everyone's going to love me and therefore I'm not going to die because everyone's going to love me. And it works. Does everyone love Katniss? No. You, they have to spend so much time and effort making people like Katniss. Not so with Lucy. Everyone loves Lucy instantly. Everybody loves Lucy. I think, <laughs> um, I, I think what makes Lucy, Lucy's character also very compelling and interesting. Uh, the biggest... Okay, so I've seen a lot of people on Book Book Talk, on YouTube reviews, call her the ultimate Mary Sue, which I think is so... Oh, you're taking I hate that. You're taking you're taking Cornelius's interpretation at at face value. Like we're seeing Lucy through Cornelius's perspective a lot of this, a lot of the time. And I I truly believe that Lucy has such a beat on everyone and everything that's happening around her that she that is how she like that's part of that social game that she's play that she plays quote unquote that she engages in is is by understanding how people work mm-hmm. there is a reason why she knows without at the end that that cornelius was thinking of that so was thinking of betraying her she didn't have to hear him say it she didn't have to hear him consider anything she never got a single clue but she knew just by seeing him that she that her life was in danger and she needed to get the fuck out uh and that's shown so often throughout the entire book series that that is who or not book series throughout the entire book that that is who lucy is right off the bat Mm -hmm. she knows who to make friends with she knows what to say to have those people be her friends she is in some way she plays the game Oh, yeah, she does. And this is the thing with Lucy, though. And she is not perfect. Okay, I hate this. Calling her a Mary Sue. Calling her a Mary Sue because she's a likable girl. I'm sorry, likable girls exist, you guys. Like, go touch some grass if you think they don't. Um, I I just, I love Lucy. I think she is very likable, but she is flawed. Okay, poor Lucy. I, I understand, okay, as somebody who was a theater kid growing up, much like Lucy, as someone who is now still today, presently a villain fucker, much like Lucy, okay, I identify and sympathize with Lucy, okay, she has her shitty ex-boyfriend, villain, he is, okay, he is, she breaks up with him only because he's cheating on her with the mayor's daughter, okay, Snow, I'm loose. She's, she's just, she has a weakness. Okay. She's not perfect. She has a weakness. She can't help this. She gets with snow. She decides to trust him and she does not wise up until he's literally having thoughts about killing her. Okay. And she, so she's not flawless. She is not a flawless Mary Sue. She just, she's just a poor little thespian villain fucker. And like, if you have never met this woman before, like, I don't understand. This woman is everywhere. There are so many Lucy Grays on the internet. <laughs> like, there are. So many. So many. Um, so I, I very much identify with Miss Lucy Gray here. And, uh, and I think she's a great character. I never identify with Katniss. Y'all know, when we were talking about those books, how many times did I say, you know, don't forget Katniss is actually a bitch. Um, I would never say that about Lucy. She is a sweet girl. She's not. She's amazing. No, I I think she's incredibly sweet. I just think that uh, she, I think that there is a take in a world in which she plays the game better than Cornelius ever gives her credit for. Yeah. uh, And that most readers ever give her credit for. I think so too. I think they see, they see a vapid girl and they don't see what's actually going on in her mind where she really wants to believe the best in people and she's not going to dump them until she has to so i also know that like i titled the things a snake in the grass and the songbird on the screen but i also think the thing is is that they both have a little snake and songbird Mm -hmm. in them uh Mm -hmm. cornelius sings 
He literally sings and snitches on everybody, which is what we learned the Jabber Jays and the and the Mocking Jays do. Is He's, they a He's a tattletale. He's uh, a tattletale. And I think Lucy Gray uh, play acts at not being a dangerous viper. Uh, and that's her like snake mm-hmm. in there. It's that she seems like this innocent girl. Well, and and she she's is. not. But she, but she, she, she is, is, she she's, is incredibly trustworthy. But the thing is, is Lucy is also not going to let you cross her. So I think she surprises people when they try to cross her and it doesn't work. I think that there's a difference between innocent and naive. Yes. And I would never call Lucy naive. Yes. The first time we're introduced to her, she knows exactly how to get an audience and she's putting a snake down the mayor's daughter's stress. Mm-hmm. Like that mm-hmm. is not a girl who's just going to sit there and be like, oh, everything's great and sunshine and roses. Like she knows she put a snake down the girl's dress. Yeah. Like she was <laughs> in her mind, like she is, hey, I'm probably not coming back here. I'm going to do what I actually want to do. That's yeah. what she does because she thinks she's never coming back to see that girl again. And so she's going to get her revenge and make sure that she yep. knows going out how she feels about her. Well, and also it, it's it's made very, very clear that uh, it was she was set up. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. That it was not by chance that her name was pulled. Yeah. Uh, that that they knew who the district the district rigged it so that it was going to be her uh and she knew like that's the other thing too is that she had a snake prepared Mm -hmm. she knew she wasn't unaware she wasn't naive that people didn't didn't like her like she she knew the beat and she took the opportunity when she could and the same thing goes with when she like like throws it doesn't throw in cornelius's face but obviously this bombing happens um and she chooses not to run away because she knows if she runs away she's gonna die anyway Mm -hmm. but if she can convince cornelius to be on her side by staying then she has a better chance then she has a better chance and that's the choice she can make and so she is making these strategic ideas uh, which is so vastly different from Katniss, who is all go go in, think think second, thought second, blow shit up, mm-hmm. uh, shoot shit, have no tact. She is the exact opposite of that, of being like, everything is a strategic move, which is yeah. also why I think Cornelius did have some attraction to her yeah. because they're so similar in that way of everything has to be planned for a reason. They Lucy both says have- that it's... They both have very high emotional intelligence. They just utilize it in very different ways. Lucy is for her own survival. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Cornelius is too, but it's for a different kind of survival. It's more for aspiration for, um, he, he has, he has high ambitions. He has high ambitions. Uh, Cornelius has everything to lose. Lucy has nothing to lose. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So those are our two main characters, but really it's all about Snow, okay? Snow is the main character. He is our protagonist. So we want to talk just a little bit about um, the way that Snow relates to the principal characters of this book, which is Lucy, Sejanus, and Tigress. So starting with Lucy, um, Snow basically falls for Lucy the first time that he sees her, and it only gets worse the more he gets to know her. And she charms him in this very interesting way where she kind of like she kind of like opens the door to a relationship a little bit, but she doesn't fully let him in. She makes him work a little bit for it. So he feels like he has something of conquest. And then whenever Snow comes to uh, be a peacekeeper in District 12 and he runs into Lucy again, he has now spent some time away from her where he is kind of like created a Lucy in his mind that is not real. And then he runs into the real Lucy again. And so now it's time to impose this will upon the real Lucy. And that's well, when his his thoughts become like very possessive. Also, like he's lost everything. 
He yeah. can no longer go to university, which was the plan originally. He has gone into the peacekeepers, which means his legacy, as far as he's concerned at this point in time, is in shambles and ruin. So the one thing he can have and can control is this spark, this open door mm -hmm. that he can, that she has kind of dropped promises for. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why he asks to go to District 12. And that's why when she he sees him again, she she he does get like as Karen said, possessive, yeah, and freakly freakly controlling. Mm -hmm. But like Lucy um, is happy to see him. She doesn't realize how much he has changed in the time she saw him last. All she knows is that she wouldn't have survived those Hunger Games without him. So the fact that yeah. he's here again and she's single, like she's interested at first and and happy to give him a chance. Well, and I think it's in that same in that same vein of like, especially when like things things got really important to them. Like it was right before the Hunger Games. They kissed right before the Hunger Games, and she don't didn't think she was gonna win. Like mm -hmm. she hoped she and she was going in and trying, but she was pretty sure the same thing of putting the snake down that girl's dress. It was like this is never gonna happen again. So I'm gonna go all in, and now. So seeing him again is like, holy shit, I get to live this thing that I didn't think was going to happen. And Snow is out here thinking like, this is the only thing that can happen. That's something that I want. And so I have to have it. Uh, and she's like, I get to have it. Uh, and that's two very different ways of coming into a relationship. Yep. Yep. And when Snow and, and kind of what happens at the end is Snow realizes that the only way to stay with Lucy would be to commit to a lifestyle change that he's not willing to commit to. Like his logical train of thought is then, well, then Lucy shouldn't exist in this world if that's the case. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, it's and I'm not even sure if it's Lucy shouldn't exist. I, I, I think it was from it was like the 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 loose threads. Mm -hmm. um, I can't have anyone out here risking knowing the truth. Mm -hmm. that's uh, also that's how he like justifies it in his mind right like in his mind he's like well i have to take her out because she knows what actually happened with that gun i can't have anybody that knows like sejanus is already dead at this point so like that's that's how he justifies it but i i think that that's just justification i think in reality it didn't really have to do with that what sealed his decision was the fact that he realized a relationship between the two of them wasn't going to happen I yeah and I think I think part of it is the justification of keeping him alive like that she can't be alive to see any of this but also like her being alive would mean that there is also proof that he failed yeah that's true and this and this this one thing is the thing that he wants and will get and then all of a sudden he realizes that he doesn't want it and he doesn't get it well that means that there's proof that he failed and he can't have that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they so he can't have anything out. else so he tries to take her out and for me that was that was what that was about it it wasn't necessarily like it was that shattering and realization of like oh the person i thought she was isn't real but i also don't think he has enough self-awareness to recognize that like it's a, I thought she was this thing. It mm -hmm. was more of a like, oh, I actually realized I don't want to go camping. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do we get rid of this failure? We pretend it never existed. Yeah, well, because he has no self-awareness. He has zero self-awareness <laughs> throughout this whole book. Like he has all these thoughts about other people. Very little thoughts of self-analysis. Analysis. Yeah. Very this little. Is, which is perfect because that's what you mm -hmm. need in a villain. Mm -hmm. As soon as you start self-critiquing you can't be a dictator that yeah, will yeah. be responsible then it's for like, thousands of lives dead because then uh, you have to like think about like how they how they would justify it. like no you can't do it no, no. self-analysis allowed yes high eq no self-awareness yes <laughs> <laughs> um so that's the snow and lucy of it all we got no one's snow and Sir Janus, which I love our little uh, your little <laughs> okay so he's it. not like a pup okay so in, in the book he's not like called a puppy or anything but like when i think of sejanus he's like a little puppy he's, he's little a puppy. puppy it's so okay just... so S snow and sejanus i want to go back a little bit to what i was saying with my favorite things but talk about it in terms of snow how many yes. times in this book does so snow say sejanus ain't my friend how many times 
27 easily like so many <laughs> so sejanus is snow's only friend let me tell you it does oh, yeah. snow can have whatever opinion he wants sejanus is his best friend forever period that's just how it is like snow can wish that sejanus wasn't his best friend but sejanus is his best friend that's just how mm-hmm. it is okay sometimes you don't get that choice sometimes people are just in your life and that's how it is yeah no they are they are best uh snow really does care about sejanus and uh, whether he wants to or not. And, and Sejanus cares about him too. Like Snow would not have agreed to go in and save Sejanus when Sejanus ran into the Hunger Games if he if he didn't care about him. Sejanus wouldn't have gone to District 12 after Snow if, you know, if Sejanus didn't care. Like they obviously they're besties. I, I think it's important to also explain and dive into the, what makes the relationship complicated and why Snow doesn't want to be friends with Sejanus because Sejanus represents everything that Snow is supposed to hate. Yeah. Sejanus has money. He, uh, so Snow's family, the Snow family uh, invested into District 13 weapons and military uh, pre war. Sejanus has gone, obviously. Yeah, and 13's gone. Uh, Sejanus invested into uh, into District 2's war. So, like, their families were automatically, like, competitors-ish. They both were creating weapons. They both were creating war strategies. Uh, and and 13 got destroyed and 2 remained two safe. Assimilated. Which means yeah, 2 assimilated Sejanus- into the capital, so. Sejanus rose not only into a class that snow does not believe you should be a part of it's the old money versus new money sort of our argument but sejanus also has the life that snow should feels like he should have had sejanus has a father who is alive that's looking out for his best interest snow doesn't have that sejanus doesn't care about the legacy because there isn't a legacy to uphold snow only has a legacy that he has to care about like sejanus is everything snow can't be and that automatically makes it incredibly complicated for a friendship uh and then you got Sejanus who's just like no we're friends we're friends we're gonna be friends it is the truth (laughs) it is the introverted it is the introverted meets an extrovert best friend uh and Mm -hmm. just forces them to be friends the extrovert who is Sejanus just forces them to be friends yeah like they're friends Um, and and the but the truth is is like whether snow wants to admit it or not they are because what does snow do when he comes back to the capital he moves in with Sejanus's parents um, because yeah. Sejanus, Sejanus died, right? So he moves in with Sejanus's parents, and um, basically Sejanus's parents take him on as their surrogate adult son, since they don't have Sejanus anymore, and they are very grateful for yeah. at least for them to know Snow and to help him further his education and start a career and those sorts of things. Like they're incredibly grateful that they get to do that with Snow, Sejanus's best friend. Well, because in some ways, Snow is the son they wish they had in some ways, too. And I think also on this, we have more proof. A, Snow wanted to yeet himself off this planet until Sejanus came into the Peacemakers. And the only time that we see Snow feel any amount of remorse or guilt at any point in this is when he sends in the Jabberjay with Sejanus talking about Mm -hmm. betraying the capital. Mm -hmm. And he there's this whole like several paragraphs of cognitive dissonances where snow then just is like, well, maybe it'll never be read or maybe they'll never hear it. And the chances of it actually making are low and this, that, like he feels guilt about what he has done. And it is the only time we see any ounce of remorse from this character having to do with Sir Janus. And that's because he cares about this character. Yeah. 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 Whether he wants to or not, he does. So the other main relationship that Snow has is between him and his cousin, Tigris. So Tigris is his older cousin, but basically his older sister, like their whole family is gone. It's just Snow, Tigris, and their grandma. So um, so even though they're cousins, they're really raised more like siblings. And um, Tigris takes care of him. Like Snow and, the, and his grandmother might not have been able to get enough food to eat to literally survive if it were not for Tigris. 
being the age she was and as resourceful as she was able to be because she has, you know, she, she is a young woman, obviously, and, and, uh, assumed to be attractive. Although snow doesn't really comment on that because this is cousin. Um, and then, uh, and then she also is a seamstress. So she has like legitimate, real usable skills. And so she uses those and she tries her best to guide snow in a proper way. There is so many hints that Tigris kind of has a clue as to what's going on in Snow's head and tries to like nudge him in a better direction. Unfortunately, she is completely unsuccessful and Snow never really fully grasps Tigris as a person unto herself and has having thoughts unto herself, unfortunately. Yeah. Psychology wise, and also I think trope book wise, uh, typically when there are two young adults without a parent parental figure, uh, one character or one person becomes parentified basically, um, and that's Tigress. Tigress is it has a very maternal um, relationship with Snow, and it does try to like appease to his ego but also at the same time appease to his good nature and appease to like the humanity in him uh keeps him alive it is the person who like solves the shirt problem is the person that when snow's world starts crumbling tigress is the one that's like hey let's breathe for a second Mm -hmm. um but at the end of the day for snow she's just another person to use it's true and really, really sad. And, um, you know, I think this will this will kind of take us into into the next little bit that we wanted to talk about. But OK, in chapter one, I have to admit, Snow's going on about his shirt. We find out Tigress is his cousin. I am groaning like, really, Tigress, you're going to bring that's the character and you're going to say that's Snow's cousin. Are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. This guy's going on about a shirt. He's so annoying. What the fuck? Y'all, I was wrong. OK. I was wrong. Tigress is a great character. Oh, oh shoot, we forgot the audible. Th- okay, I forgot this was next. Okay, wait, hold, hold, hold on the pause. tigress. Pause. pause on the tigress. Okay, you guys, um, uh, guess what? Interstage Window is sponsored by Audible. You guys know that because you're here all the time. Um, you should use Audible because I use Audible and it's great. I'm gonna pin this. Uh, if you have not used Audible before, it's like truly, truly good. That's how I read this book. Um, and I really liked I liked the Audible version. Did you read it, Landon, or did you um did you do the Audible? The Audible version was great. It's good, right? I I absolutely loved the uh I absolutely loved the narrator. Uh, I also loved that you could listen to it on one and a half speed and it be really well done still too. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when you uh speed up a person's voice, it's not as well done, but it's yeah. this one was very well done. Yeah, I also I listen on 1.8 speed almost exclusively. If a voice sounds bad on the 1.8 speed, I probably am not going to listen to that book. <laughs> but yeah, it was really good. So um, audibletrial.com slash interstage window. If you would like to support what we do here, you can sign up there. And um, and we do get a little bonus for that. So very, would very much appreciate it. If you do not have an Audible subscription and you want to get one to use that link. Landon, do we have any other Audible recommendations today? Um, I don't have one that's out yet. I have one that's coming out in November. As you all know, I am obsessed with Fourth Wing. Uh, I it has it. been my recommendation several times on this podcast because it's Hunger Games, but War College with dragons. Okay, what's not to love? We already have uh, it. Iron Flame comes out. Uh, the sequel comes out same day on Audible as it does uh, the actual book being published. So uh, if the I that's also another one that I listen to on Audible as well as reading. Um, so if you've done what I've told you to do and you've listened to slash read Fourth Wing, then you'll get right on it for November 8th when... For, when Iron Flame comes out, and if you haven't listened to me, then now would be the time because you got one month until the best sequel ever comes out. Yeah, so you can get it now and you can use your credit for the first book, right? And then you can use your next month's credit for the sequel. There you go. And it's free. And it's There free. you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you get with the one with the subscription, you get the one credit each month. So, yes. yeah. 
So yeah, audibletrial.com slash your stage window. Woo. Let's okay, back talk to about Tigress. it. <laughs> back to Tigress. Okay. I was wrong. Tigress is great, actually. The fact that they chose Tigress and fleshed Tigress out, I by the end of the book, I was like, why did I hate the first chapter? I was so dumb. The first chapter yeah. was great, actually. And like I went back and re-listened to the first chapter and I was like, yeah, I was just wrong. I was just ready to hate, you know, because of what I had heard from book talk and, and from like being uh, so burned by franchises that just go on and on and on and on and on for freaking ever and never, ever end. And, oh, you know, we'll I was ready later. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, so I was ready. I was but I was wrong. Y'all, it's good. It's good. And yeah. Tigris is good. And there's other Easter eggs that are also good. So talking about being burned, we have, of course, we hate for everything to come back to the series that must not be named. But <laughs> Harry Potter uh, is really, truly that YA boom that then had multiple spinoffs, prequels, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> and I'm reading this and I get to Tigris and I just get that scene when Minerva McGonagall appears uh in the in harry in at hogwarts and fantastic beasts and where to find them yes and i am just like this doesn't make fucking sense like mcgonagall didn't make sense then tigress doesn't make fucking sense now are you gonna fucking do this to us are you really gonna have these little easter eggs are you gonna do what the we know cannot be done right and then they do it right. She does it right. Suzanne Collins does it so freaking well. Because it makes have sense. Shouldn't have doubted. Uh, you know, yeah. the capital is old money. Mm -hmm. um, and having familiar names sprinkled in with non-familiar names, which is the important part of this, 100% works. Yeah. Tigress uh, felt like being able to bring her in and having that full character because there's a point in time where we also realize that she is very anti-hunger games um or doesn't like the hunger games and so like then that connecting to her later uh in the in the actual hunger Games series and like understanding that why she it would help them why she's willing to why she's not as scared to as other sympathizers might be like why her and not other sympathizers well she has a dog in this race because she's snow's cousin so she's not mm -hmm. scared of him in the way that other sympathizers might be and she's seen the person he was mm -hmm. in ways that others might not yeah, she, like, she, she knows he didn't have to go this, the down truth. this route yeah, she knows he didn't have to go down this route. The boy's got never had a, a, a the boy has never ever had an original thought. If other people had implanted better thoughts in him, then he would have been fine and normal, dude. But no, but no. So, so yeah. Tigress is incredibly done well. Um, there's some familiar last names, Havensby being one of them. Um, Havensby Hall in the academy. Yeah. We see a couple others that all make sense because they're all old money mm -hmm. uh there are some we're not a huge fan of yeah okay so there's one so there's one i didn't like so caesar flickerman we have caesar's ancestor come on as as the presenter of these hunger games okay just like caesar flickerman is in the the you know original trilogy this man is a weatherman who kind of gets pulled in because he's available and has a good tv voice I, I don't understand why they gave him, why they made him Caesar's ancestor when he literally was exactly the same character. There was no differences. I want to see like, I want to see like some oomph, you know, some meat. Like they give Tigress so much meat to her character yeah. and why I liked it. Heavensby, it was just a random name drop. I like it. Caesar literally copy and pasted the character. That was like, oh, yeah, I hit, hit, if... miss. For me, it was it was like, oh, okay. If you had, if you had not done the exact same character, if it would make sense for a more morose, I'm like have like the nineteen nineteen sixties mid Atlantic accent in my head of like how radio oh, yeah, used yeah. to be very serious and very like this is the thing, like. If you had had that kind of character, that would have also fit the theme and the feelings of the Hunger Games what in that, if, day, in oh that day and age. What if he would have been like a super serious, like delivering the news, like um, like very plain, like a Walter Cronkite? So yes. like, that would have been great. 
because then it was like, oh, there's a legacy there, but it's obviously changed over time with the feelings of the Hunger Games and also like, you 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 know like things things evolve more mm-hmm. to be to to be more a uh, bigger like that's yeah. typically how things evolve and so this would have evolved from like a very morose very okay this is the thing this is the news blah 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 to like the caesar flickerman that we know and love yeah uh it it would have been a little bit i think better yeah um it wouldn't have made me feel like a copy and paste which this felt like a copy of being it like, was it okay, was the same really? he was goofy <sighs> in the exact same ways a flamboyant in the exact same ways like it was the same character it was the same character yeah. she suzanne collins um, just apparently loved caesar flickerman that much she put him in this book again for, for no reason yeah, or and or like the other option too was like putting a very young caesar flickerman in there of a young boy who's finally getting a chance Mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. and then us being like holy shit how old is caesar flickerman and being like that also that also fits the character though of being like oh this person is like how much work has he had done (laughs) it has had so much work that we could never tell yeah um but of course i think uh, i think tied with tigress perhaps even better is the ultimate easter egg of the hanging tree we learn that the hanging tree song was written by lucy gray baird and it's about what she witnesses when it comes to sejanus's hanging so that song later on becoming a protest song because that's what it is in the books it's a protest song from an earlier failed rebellion like just imagine how that would make snow feel and it's so good like you yeah. can see exactly what the lyrics are saying now in and uh, and kind of why they what why they're alluding to what they're alluding to it's just it's so good um, and the way that they deliver it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel Easter eggy at all. It feels like, oh, of course that's how it happened. Of course. No. And it, it it fits really well. I think that's, um, obviously the hanging tree in the movies got really big. Like it made charts. It yeah. got really big. People knew of it and being able to take something that was popularized and beloved and just make it better give it some meat Mm -hmm. is really cool Mm -hmm. and really well done and really thought through and adds like yeah and like you said imagine snow like so no wonder snow gets so fucking enraged when they start playing these anti-capital videos and anti-snow videos on a song about his only friend in the world being killed because of something he did Mm -hmm. like the way that he betrayed like there's so many levels of of there that's just so fascinating yeah i love it i absolutely love it Uh, so at at this point if you are not convinced that this book is actually good (laughs) let's let me give you a couple more arguments so we are going to directly address book talk booktube we're talking to you now if you're a book this talk is, booktube we're talking to you this is a brand new uh esw section this yes. is where we we're gonna have a whole thing you ready for it we're ready uh enter stage window presents the fandom is lying holy shit okay so uh, like from the girls who brought you spot the problems yeah the fandom and, and other things is like is <laughs> children children constantly being abused and why oh my god so much <laughs> so much so much abuse but yeah the fandom is lying y'all book talk and booktube i don't know i like i think <sighs> the internet fandom internet has become so puritan it drives me nuts i truly think that they did not like this book because it was about a villain and they wanted to be uwu pure okay so here because here's the deal here's the deal this is not really young adult. This is much more new adult, okay? So if you went mm-hmm. expecting young adult, you ain't gonna get it, okay? The characters in this, like Snow is one of the youngest main characters in this, okay? Snow yep. and Lucy are some of the youngest main characters. Um, everyone is 18 plus, basically. Like, 
it's not really young adult, young adult anymore. It's new adult, which means that like things are a little bit deeper. They're a little bit more serious. More more bad things happen. More bad things are explicit. I'm not saying bad things also, don't happen in the Hunger Games, but they're more explicit in this book. It's also directed towards an older audience, which yes. is, I believe, was the correct move genre right wise to make this move. Um, but that also means that it isn't going to follow the YA scale of here is a hero here's the way that the world is putting that hero down and here's how we are going to support that hero like that that is not what this book is no um know. and well, i'll give you an example of something really gruesome that happens in the book that would have never been written this way if it was hunger games so in in this time period, remember the pomp and circumstance around the Hunger Games simply doesn't exist. It's being it's being conceived of because of Lucy Gray's success and in showing like that performance. So when the tributes are brought into the capital, instead of being brought in on chariots with you know costumers and they're pampered and they get good food and you know all these things, instead they are taken to the zoo and dumped into a monkey cage. And no one feeds them, okay? They they drink the water that just happens to already be in the enclosure at the zoo that was for the monkeys. It's not clean. Um, it's disgusting. They have no bathroom, okay? Um, it, it's awful. And it's described. Everything I'm talking about is described and said. No one, no one pretends that, like, we're just going to ignore the fact that the capitals... No, like, there are multiple passages where different characters comment on the fact that no one is feeding the tributes. And they're hungry. And they're dying. Because no one's feeding them. Like, and he would have never... That would have never happened in the original Hunger Games. Never. No. Nope. Um, and because of this genre shift the characters are more complicated yes and i i karen had said this and i was like holy shit that's exactly what it is uh i think we're seeing that those who are not basing this off of uh puritan ideations uh, are not do not know how to read a book with an unreliable character narrator. That's what I believe. If I think about these these book talkers and these booktubers, okay, the ones that don't give me the vibe of they hate it because it's a villain and they, you know, they've got that ooh woo Puritan progressive nonsense going on. What instead is bothering them is that they're reading from an unreliable narrator and they're constantly reading this book, going, "That's bullshit. That's bullshit. That's bullshit." Because he's lying. He's lying over and over. And you're supposed to know he's lying. Like, it's not a secret. I don't think Suzanne Collins is writing it thinking that, like, anyone believes Snow, okay? I don't yeah. think that. But for whatever reason, a lot of these reviewers, like, act like it's bad that he's lying all the time. And it's like, no, people lie it's, sometimes in their own thoughts. That happens. It's like Suzanne's, like, there's a lot of claims that it was Suzanne's Collins intention to make us feel sorry for Snow. Yeah, but no, and it's like, never, ever feel oh, sorry for him. I, you, you can't, you can feel empathy for him. You can sit mm -hmm. there and be like, holy shit, this character that seems so villainous and so flat is actually incredibly complicated and deep and has had experiences that are engaging and traumatizing absolutely fucking mm -hmm. but i didn't walk away at any point in time as the thesis of this book you should feel bad for the man who supported the murder of thousands of children over the course of 75 years like there is nothing in this novel that is saying that but the people who are reading it are having that as a takeaway mm -hmm. and it's because if you do read it at face value if you read it like you never read the hunger games and you're just expecting you know snow to be the good guy the protagonist that we're rooting for the hero of the story you're like okay what's the like this is a bad takeaway you're we're meant to root for the villain and it's like yeah yeah you're not there's I, I just i kind of like i feel like what people expected is some character to come in and be like, Snow, you're wrong. I'm going to lay out my thesis about why you're such a terrible... And no character ever does that, okay? First, um, Sejanus dies before he realizes 
Snow's issues. Lucy Gray runs away, okay, from him. Tigress, he's family and she pities him and wishes he would become, you know, someone neutral instead of someone also, bad. Um, like recognizing also gains favor with the system. As yes. Snow gains power back, Tigress also does too, which is why yes. she's in the power position when we meet her in the in, in Mockingjay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like, because there's not a character that comes in and been like, hey guys, did you know Snow's wrong and bad actually? I'm here to tell you about that. No character ever does that. And so I feel like a lot of these reviewers, because that doesn't happen, they then like put these ideas onto the book that aren't there. Like, y'all, you're not stupid. Obviously Snow is bad. He, The things that he thinks are incredibly controlling and evil and manipulative. Like you don't need someone to tell you, guess what? Snow's being, S Snow manipulated me. Oh, I'm so, so sad. Snow manipulated me to realize that he's manipulative. Like we're smarter than that. We don't need to be told that. And I just well, think I also, that, I just think that like, they just, they just don't want to read an unreliable narrator. They just don't want to read it. I think also like, part of this too is that it was people assumed that it was also a love story like that people call this a love story when it's not um people want to throw romance into a story that's not romantic there is like yes there are two people who fall in love but they certainly don't actually fall in love no it's right? lovers like, to enemies it's lovers to enemies not enemies to lovers it's, like i yeah it's not it's just that there that was a plot po like that was a point that pushed a character analysis forward mm -hmm. of understanding how really different like if you're looking at it we needed to this is a character sheet on snow and we needed to see snow in all aspects of different in different relationships we needed to see him in friendship which was sir Jonas didn't believe didn't didn't believe that he was like actually friends with this person no matter how close and how dependent they got on each other needed to see him with family with tigress and also needed to see him in a romantic relationship recognizing that he can't make romantic connections because it's all about how they impact his life rather than the actual relationship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and trying to pretend that like uh cornelius snow at 18 years old you know, doesn't look at this girl that obviously everyone thinks is like super hot and super cool and super fun that he's not going to get the hots for her too. Like, obviously he is. I mean, unless he's somewhere on the ace spectrum or something, you know? Um, so like, it's just, it just blows my mind. It blows my mind because when I, when I read this book, I did not no, I was going to like it as much as I did. I knew everyone hated it. So I didn't go in thinking I was going to hate it, but I thought I would have some pretty legitimate criticisms. And the truth is, I have very few criticisms of this book. I think it was, for the most part, incredibly well written, and I wouldn't recommend really a lot of changes at all. I think people just don't want to read a story with an unreliable narrator. They just, the media literacy in our country is so abysmally low that they cannot conceptualize an unreliable narrator or if they can they can't tolerate it and i think there's an argument there too of being like okay we're also recognizing exposure like yes. have these ha like it's not only the media literacy but have the people who are reading this who grew up reading YA been exposed to unreliable narrators other than Holden Caulfield probably freaking not and reading Holden Caulfield Catcher in the Rye they probably were forced to in school and rather I also than think that I think that a lot of the things that that Holden holds back about also is like where he was traumatized and used by adults. And so yes. if you don't, I think at that age, if you don't have someone explain to you, like what Holden is talking about right here is that he was abused, um, then it's harder to make that connection at that yes. age. Like you need a little, you need a little coaxing at that age. And if you've never been taught that, then you, and then you wouldn't know. You'd have to figure it out on your own somehow. Well, especially also not to like, 
dissect psychology here but especially also if you are traumatized in the same way that holden was which a lot of young a lot adults of kids are, are uh don't understand even if you're being told that this is abuse do not understand that it's actually abuse uh <laughs> like that's also part of it um but i i think that like okay that is something that is just a hole in the consumer's knowledge of we have a ecosystem of really of readers who read quite a bit that haven't had the exposure to a book like this and i am Mm -hmm. so thrilled that this book exists because what it could mean for the genre at large i I want to see i want to see more books with unreliable characters with or unreliable narrators with interesting uh, interesting dynamics uh that can also be presented in the way that like what makes new adults and young adults so approachable is that how it's written the speed it's written the plot heavy focus uh and familiar tropes so continuing all of those genre genre elements also including some of these literary elements that have been lost on this generation of readers would be amazing. It would be super amazing. I don't know that, I I mean, I I have some hopes. Obviously this was successful enough to get a movie, but I think part of that is just because it was Hunger Games. We'll see. Um, I know the movie is going to sell more books, right? And bring more people into the, into reading this book. Like I know that, but I kind of think that this is, um, I kind of think this is girl version of Fight Club. And how many bros like love Fight Club and don't get it partly because of the unreliable narrator situation yeah. going on in Fight Club. I almost kind of feel like Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is a little, it's Girl Fight Club a little bit. So little bit I don't want to get my hopes up too high because <laughs> we know we all know a Fight Club, bro. We all knew one when when that movie was popular. OK, we all knew the guy that had the Fight Club poster in his bedroom and did not understand Fight Club true we also with this particular thing too, have a large majority of people who are just hating on it because it doesn't have a thesis statement that aligns with uh views of you know you must be a good person in order to have anything any sort of success but i mean i think the thesis statement of this book is the same thesis statement that is that is in the hunger games absolutely people, people are what they are based on the system that they live in and the experiences that they have. Like, I don't really think the point of this book is any different than the point of a Hunger Games. It's just instead of an action YA book, she wrote like a, a new adult character sketch, but it's the same politically and morally. The message is the same. Yeah. She kept, she kept to her point, which is also why I think this book was so successful and why I will trust other books that she puts out if she chooses to return back to this to this world and chooses to do a book a sequel or a book similar or Mm -hmm. or another prequel I will support it because I genuinely think that she has proven that she can keep her thesis in mind not undercut the purpose of her original series uh as well as write something interesting yeah, I would read more Hunger Games books and they wouldn't even have to be as good as this. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I would I would read more Hunger Games books. Like the fact that this one exists sh- is exactly what you said. It shows that I should trust her writing in this world again as much as she wants. So I think that brings us to our final part of uh-huh. did it resonate? Oh Karen, my god, did- yes. Yes. Yeah. Like the heck. Like I I just think that like so long as our political climate continues down the road that it's going on at the moment, um books like this are going to continue to resonate with me. Like I don't I don't see I don't I don't foresee a future where this type of thing would not resonate with me. I hope for that future. I hope for that future that I can look back and I can say that's so early 2000s. I we don't do that anymore. I hope that when I'm old, I can say that I do. I'm not sure I believe that's the case. But yes, it does resonate. I think um, it is incredibly uh, powerful in understanding how uh, the ego can interact with people's perception of their own power that are in that kind of upper class, because even though Snow is poor, he is in that upper class. 
um, and how that can have ramifications on our world as a whole, since they are the class that's in power. So yes, absolutely. Like I can't, I couldn't even wait for you to finish the question. Like that's how much of a yeah. yes it is. <laughs> um, so Landon, does I, it resonate with you? A thousand percent. The same, yeah. the same way that you, it resonates for you. Uh, I think that, uh, unfortunately our world is, uh, can be very, very black and white, especially when we're talking about, uh, the impact of systems in place and, uh, the concept of good guys versus bad guys and that bad guys and that, that, that conversation is uncomplicated. Uh, really, I think ruins, uh, and, and, and cuts us off and our power off at the knees and mm -hmm. books like this that show the complications of what the other side of the system does will only continue to empower us. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and any sort of like taking it down, I think, it does us a disservice and does the point of this series a disservice. Uh, but it absolutely resonates. Uh, I love that I can connect to Cornelius on a human level and also understand that he is a monster who, and see how he becomes a monster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, 100%. So yeah, we loved it. We love this book and you should read it too. It was so good. I'm very excited for the movie. I don't know how they're going to do it. Uh, but I also trust, the like that's the other thing too with this series. Like they did a fantastic job for the first three movies. Yeah. I'm really hoping that they'll keep that resonate. Like they'll keep that speed up for this one. We'll find out. We're going to go see it. Okay. And we are definitely going to talk about it in December. So we're not going to wait for it to come out on streaming. So sometime in December, one of our podcasts will be about the movie. So yeah. Yes. Okay. Where you can find us, Landon, where can everyone find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram or TikTok. I have a very exciting project coming up in the next couple, six, six to nine weeks uh, that I'm really excited about. So you can find me at Land in Maine on either of the social medias. I'm also on X until they start charging me to be on there. Uh, but it's mostly just D&D &D stuff on there for right now. Yeah, I moved. I'm on I'm on Blue Sky now. I have some invite codes if anybody would like to get on Blue Sky, but I stopped going on X. I'm done with it. I know that still has the Twitter icon. That's because I made this deck two weeks ago. Also, those the graphics of what I'm streaming next are wrong, but that's okay. I didn't update them. That's my fault. Um, but yeah, I have I'm on Blue Sky now. I think did I update my did I update my thing? I did. There's where you can find me on Blue Sky. Okay. If you are on Blue Sky, come follow me. If you're not on Blue Sky and you wish you were, hit me up because I do have invite codes and I am not just going to post them out there so a bot can take them. So like y'all let me know. Thank you so much, Lunar. Thank you so much for the applause. Now Landon can live another week. So yes, okay, so what we are doing um, after we say goodbye to Landon here is we're going to be continuing our hardcore um, World of Warcraft run on our uh, Warlock. Also, tomorrow we're going to be playing some more of our Final Fantasy X-2. We are almost at the end, you guys. This might be the last 10 2 stream of this new Yevon run. Now, we will do it again. Um, I'll talk about that more tomorrow. And then actually next week on here is not Stardew Valley. It is our follow-up conversation for Ballad of Songbirds and Stakes, which is the dangers of continuing the story. So if that interests you, come back next week. We're going to talk about the franchises um, that never end. They just go on and on, my friend. Some people started writing them not knowing what it was. Couldn't, and then couldn't stop. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then didn't stop. writing them forever just because. And kept, and kept getting louder and louder and louder about it. It's the franchise oh that never ends. Yes. So we're going to talk about that next week. All right. All right. Let me get it. Let me switch back to the big cameras. Okay. So everybody say goodbye to Landon. Thank you so much. We will see you next week, my friend. Um, for y'all watching the VOD on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below. And you should come over to Twitch and follow me here so you can catch us live. Because um, it's so much more fun when it's live, I think. It so, is. Yeah. All right. Bye, YouTube. All right. Bye. Don't forget to be awesome. Yes. And don't forget to make it a great day.